is anything going on? We're getting married in like six weeks. If anything was going on, I'd let you know. Most actors would play the role of Jordan and get weeks of study to the level you portrayed him. What advantages did you have understanding the character, given you also wrote and directed him? We had all of the advantages. Uh, so I have 24 hour access to the lead actor. So I can rehearse, uh, I can rehearse in the shower. I can rehearse on the commute there. I can um, make sure that the actor knows his lines for the most part. Uh, and that is incredibly valuable to, to not put the weight of the movie on someone else. I know what the movie needs and I know that I have to, I will do the work to get it done. Excellent. Uh... PJ, co-directing is a delicate balance, especially when also acting in the film. How did you and Jim handle conflicts on the set and who called out cut in the scenes you did together? I mean, it really, there was never like a day we woke up, you're like, you handle these, these duties and you do this. It was very fluid and it really kind of changed cool. based on who was doing what. I mean, obviously Jim is on camera a lot. So I was, you know, behind camera on monitor and on script, making sure we were getting everything we needed, directing Jim, but you know, also vice versa for our scenes together. It's helpful too, because I mean, you know, writing the movie was kind of directing it, like you know, when we were putting it together in the first place. So we really kind of had a good idea of what we needed before we even got on set, um, and had such a limited time to do it that we didn't have a lot of time to kind of try different things or anything. So uh, yeah, it, it it kind of I don't know. It was just easy. I mean, we're best friends in real life. So it was just like making a best, making a movie with your best buddy. It was, awesome. it really was uh, incredibly uh, easy to do and a lot of fun. Great. Uh, Jim Jordan is a complex and unpredictable character. What do you think is the key characteristic of his soul? That is the definition of his persona. And how do you relate to the fraudulent facade? He seems to place upon himself in the film. I think that Jordan is this really uh, confused guy and he probably watched Entourage at the fraternity house and then thought that this would be a cool thing where he'd get to wear nice outfits and be taken seriously. I think that's like the ultimate goal is for him to be respected and taken seriously and we never give him that in the film. It's really, he's <laughs> constantly uh, ridiculed and demeaned, which is so much fun to watch. Um, and then to answer the second part, I, I think everybody relates to that facade, the, especially in, in the film industry, we all either know people who constantly have to bullshit and they call it show business for a reason. It's like this thing that we have to falsify. Um, but then Jean-Paul Sartre says that, uh, he said, uh, there's no such thing as a waiter, it's only people pretending to be a waiter. And I think we all do that to an extent. We, we have these pleasantries that make us um, not the chimpanzees that we are in real life. Um, and I find that to be very interesting to, to watch somebody dip below that social pressure of the facade um, is very dramatic and also very funny. That's wild. Uh, PJ, sex and the backlash problem situation that is hashtag me too are creative themes in the beta tests. Since sex is an Achilles heel and most, if not all of us, what did the creation of this story uh, tell you about your own relationships to the dynamics and politics of sexuality? I mean, it shows that, uh, you know, it's, it, it spans everywhere. It's, it's every culture. I mean, it's it happening for everybody. I mean, a big part of this was the fact that anyone could get a purple envelope in the mail, I think you know adultery and cheating and lying is very real and things are always going to be there these temptations are always going to be there and it's just it's up to us to be held accountable and be honest with each other uh because even though the internet has changed uh the way we communicate uh it's still the same problems we've always had as uh in relationships and being honest and in communication with your significant other jim you're a handsome man <laughs> <laughs> And beauty and appeal are the commodity that Hollywood sells. What are your feelings about making yourself a commodity and what are your survival instincts to prevent getting lost in it? Yeah, I mean, it really is a taste issue. Taste, I think, is a currency and having good taste is very important. I don't know. I think it really is a personal 
uh, thing for everybody of what they want to do. Um, but I agree with that. I mean, I think really there is a weird brand to what we do. I like to think of it more as like infusing comedy into really high quality story engines or genre engines or whatever it is. But a lot of people see it as, you know, Jim's internet DIY filmmaking ethos. And um, I think it, it's dangerous to fall into that. Um, sometimes people get caught up in their own bullshit. And um, that's why we made this movie. It's, it's like to, to watch somebody re reach the end of the rope of their own narrative uh, and then realize that that's not who they are, you know? You both create a Hitchcockian paranoia in the film. What did you learn in your film life from various masters of the form? And is there a direct tribute to any other filmmaker in, in, in the movie that you can point towards? I mean, this is clearly our best David Fincher impression. Um, I mean, like heavily, especially the opening scene. Um, you know, I, obviously to try to build tension. I mean, starting with that incredibly graphic murder that opens the movie and just really sets the stakes right away. Uh, yeah, very, it was very, when we originally wrote it, we were trying to write like a more of a Giallo style Italian slasher film from the seventies or, you know, that's very stylized and crazy and graphic and gory. And we were like, what a funny world to set that in, in, in Hollywood with a noir detective engine, but then make it funny. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad it all came together because it was wild to, to write it and certainly to, to put it together. This is for both of you. What in each of your experiences in working in Los Angeles came to represent the core of the story, especially when it comes to how the money agent relationship comes into play? Yeah, I mean, the agents go towards the money no matter what, and most times they don't really care about independent film by any means, film uh, in general. Like, a lot of them are impersonating Wall Street. That's why they wear the wardrobes the same way. It's, it's, it's more about power and money than it ever is about, you know, making movies. You can ask them the simplest questions about you know, what is a DCP? What, what is, you know, what, what is, like what kind of editing software, budgeting software to use? And they don't they have no idea. It's like, it's nothing to do with making movies. Um, it's such a strange industry. And uh, really we've kind of dodged it and circumvented it as best we could with this one particularly. Um, but no, I think the future of that is going away. The fact that we can make our movie in a basement uh, that I'm talking to you in right now and use the technology that's at every, all of our fingertips um, by getting some friends together and, uh, you know, sneaking gunpowder into an agency's garage to blow it up. It feels like, uh, uh, you know, it's coming out on Guy Fawkes Day. It's coming out on November 5th. So it's not nice. lost on us um, how revolutionary the movie will be. Um, but no, I think the, the internet is changing everything. And I think um, nowadays you can make movies on your own and you don't have to go through these formal systems that were built in the 1920s, you know? I mean, we literally, we made this movie through the internet. I mean, we made this movie by just going to the general public and, and offering shares to buy into the company um, and, and come along for the ride and trust us to deliver a movie that is our unique voice. Uh, we didn't have to take any notes from anybody um, and we could tell it our way. And I think it had to be that way. And I do believe yeah. that's the future. Final question. What are your best tips on delivering a top drawer and beautifully rendered film on the tenth of a budget of an average Hollywood film, hmm. uh, you have to work harder than anybody else. You have to work three times harder than anybody else, uh, and you have to learn all of the software to do every step of the post production. Um, and you just have to have watched a thousand movies and know that it's going to work, and take huge risks. Like PJ and I raised the funds ourselves through a crowd equity platform and that debt was gonna fall on us. Like if we hadn't sold the film and it hadn't been any good, we'd have been screwed, you know? Like, but you really have to bet on yourself and your talents. And um, as soon as you do, you'll feel, uh, you'll feel much more um, capable and realize that that's all anybody else is doing too. Yeah, I mean, yeah, don't be afraid to tell your weird stories. And yeah, I mean, obviously you have to wear a lot of hats. You have to be able to do a lot of different jobs uh, to save time and money and uh, yeah, and, and do it with, you know, your friends, people you trust, people you love. I mean, we made this movie with all of our best friends. I mean, made it with my best friend um, and people you can, you can trust and, and want to go to bat for. And, uh, and yeah, and it's also helpful, uh, you know, 
have your best friend be really good at After Effects and learn all the programs when you're not. <laughs> uh, yeah, so and when be you're a handsome not, man. This is Patrick McDowell for HollywoodChicago.com. Copyright 2021.